Hello, and welcome to another episode of Darwin Investors. Today, we're going to talk about why retail traders seem to lose money. Um, and then later on in the video, I'll show you what I'm doing to actually be making money during this market crash. And although I do have unrealized losses, same as anybody else, I am still making money during this crash. And I'm going to show you how I'm doing it. So let's go ahead and share my screen here, and we'll get started right away. So first, we'll have a quick pep talk. Uh, Bank of America came in and they said retail investors are still buying the dip in stocks while hedge funds sell amid war in Ukraine. And this could be a good sign for the stock market, says Bank of America. Basically, we retail investors are better than we think. Buying the dip has been a good strategy this year. So retail clients have been more aggressive buyers of the dip than other 10% corrections post-crisis, potentially on fear of missing out on what generally has been a successful strategy post-crisis. While retail investors are buying stocks, hedge funds are reducing their exposure to the stock market. The bank said there was a record outflow from stocks from its hedge fund clients last week as investment firms seek to de-risk their portfolio amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine. To most market participants, the scenario where retail investors were, were commonly called dumb money are buying and hedge funds, often dubbed smart money, are selling, doesn't bode well for the future direction of the broader stock market. But Bank of America found that investment actions by retail investors have actually generated a positive signal for future performance of the stock market. Despite the narrative we hear from some investors that retail is a contrary indicator, our data suggests the opposite. S&P 500 returns following periods of retail inflows have been above average and return uh, post retail selling has is below average. So basically, if you if you buy after we sell, you're probably uh, going to be below average. That, that's according to this. Um, the retail clients. Are, have been the only net buyers of stocks year to date. These are the sectors they we've been buying. It's communication services, so I guess we're into Facebook financials. So we're so we're in obviously the banks have been hit hard in industrial. So I guess we're like in like John Deere and Caterpillar. Meanwhile, sectors that saw the most outflows of B of A's client base were led by technology and energy stocks, suggesting that some investors are taking profits off the table following oil's historic surge, and that's super smart. I wouldn't touch an oil stock right now with anybody's money. I think that it's at or near a top. Um, and so that's just not the way I think. I like to think a little bit contrarian. So this is an article that shows that retail investors, we're not as bad as we think. We know when, we, we know when to get in. Our, our problem is that we don't know when to get out. And we some of us don't know quite what we own. Although I would say that the people they're looking at in this in this particular article that are buying financials and and communication services and the like and industrials this is not the person that's buying some of the more questionable high growth no profit stocks this article here gets into why most traders lose money and why the market requires it and i'll just kind of hit on the gist of it so what they say is that we're, we're crowd followers and they use this example this mark this article was written back in 2018 but this is bitcoin from 2018 it had a bunch of people piling into bitcoin um and they didn't really know what it was and this is back in 17 when really nobody knew what it was and they were like well why are you buying it well it's because it's going up okay um but the problem is when you run out of buyers the stock will only go up so high. And I know that people don't like Bitcoin to be called a stock, but kind of acts like one. But, um, but when you run out of buyers, that's your peak. And then it starts to fall down until you run out of sellers. And that's the bottom. And at the bottom, it only has one way to go, and that's up if you've run out of sellers. And so, but this article is saying that we tend to buy on the way up and sell at the bottom because we're following a crowd. And the only way that this happens is a crowd of people have sold and a crowd of people have bought. So that makes sense. That's an excellent uh, theory as far as I'm concerned. Um, not only are most people left holding the bag at the top, they also tend to panic out and sell at market bottoms. Their capitulation selling means there is no one left to sell. So shortly after the price starts rising. So we're selling out at the worst possible times. When the outlook is most bleak because everyone you know is losing money and all you see on TV is how bad the markets are, there is strong incentive to sell and follow the crowd. Once again, the crowd makes a poor decision, which it can't help doing, and the market then turns the other way. 
So right now, um, in this in this example of Bitcoin, like I said, a lot of people back then they didn't know what they held, and I was I would contest that a lot of people right now don't know what they own when they own crypto. A lot do, but there are plenty that probably don't. And um, when it starts to go backwards on them, they don't know what it is, so they just panic and sell because how far down is it going to go? I know I panic whenever I get into a stock that I know is fairly questionable, then I know that doesn't have any earnings, but I'm just trying to catch a you know catch a wave. Uh, when I see it go down, I, I I tend to panic out of those stocks myself, and I will get into those. Uh, you know, I don't trade only the you know the really sound value stocks. I will throw the dice from time to time. Um, and so those those types of stocks it'll scare me out of but i would say that right now it's really important for us to know what we own make sure that it's quality and that you're sticking to that and then also the only another thing to stick to is stick to a plan successful traders find something that works and stick to it not letting others pull them away from their strategy this is where unsuccessful traders go wrong and why the crowd loses money Despite most people's best efforts, they can't pull themselves away from the crowd when it really counts. And so the strategy that I'm going to show you that I do, um, it's, it's one that, that it keeps me very disciplined. Um, so even if I wanted to sell out of the market, I really couldn't um, because I've got my money, my, my money or my shares tied up in contracts. So I can't really sell out even if I wanted to. So it forces me to slow down, take a breath. And then, um, and, and then make small gains as I go along. And in doing so, it brings the cost basis of what I've bought down. So let's say I bought something for 100, I'm able to bring it back down to say 90. And I'll show you how I'm doing that. Um, why most traders lose money, it's a numbers game. And we already went over that, that, um, that they're gonna lose money because if you're following the crowd, you're gonna buy at the top and sell at the bottom. But they also talk about most professional money managers can't beat the S&P 500 benchmark. Well, of course they can't. They are the S&P 500. They're not gonna lose to it either though, so that's that's good news, but they're not gonna beat it. Um, so that's the reason for that, that bit there. Set yourself apart from the crowd. We've already discussed that. Try and get away from the trend. Stick to your trading plan. And that's something that I'll show you what, what I do and how I do it. The bottom line is that traders must stick to a well-defined plan and trade that plan even when it's uncomfortable. The vast majority of the population and thus the vast majority of traders buckle under this uncomfortable pressure. The same way we reach for the chocolate bar instead of the carrots. Um, yeah, so I'll show you my plan in a second here. Buy an index fund. If you don't know what you want, you don't know what you're doing, just go with the S&P 500. You'll do at least as well as, as the big funds um, do because you'll be doing exactly as they do. So that's actually a really good plan. You're basically part of the institution if you just buy the, the, the SPY. And finally, do your own research. Like I said, there are certain stocks that scare me away. And, these are, um, and that's because I've researched it and and sometimes I'll buy them anyway, and I know what I've done. If I've bought something like, say, CrowdStrike or uh, Zscaler, I know those companies don't make money. I know they're way overvalued. You know, so any dip in those scare, <laughs> scares me, even if like everybody says, oh, you got, you got to buy cybersecurity. Well, a $20 dip in Zscaler scares the bejeebers out of me because I don't know where it's going to stop. It could go to 20 bucks. You know, that's all it's worth, basically. Um, and so, yeah, so do your research and know what you own. Um, I'll show you a couple of stocks, and this might make a couple of people upset that are watching this, but a couple of stocks. I'll show you my two least favorite stocks that I see people talk about all the time, and I'll tell you why, and that's based on research here. My least favorite stock is probably SoFi. Um, people talk about this. It's got a very large market cap. It's got no earnings and people are just like, how low can it go? How low can it go? Well, the reason why I dislike this stock so much is because um, they've recently acquired a bank charter and they're a money lender and, and they've got a bank charter. So they want to be called a fintech, but I look at them as a bank and they're a bank <laughs> that has no PE ratio. And not only do banks trade at a discount to the S&P 500. They trade at a wicked discount to the S&P 500. So in order for this thing to come into um, bank territory, it would have to start making money and have a price to earnings ratio in the, in the range of say 12 or 10. Um, so this thing's got a long ways to fall as far as I'm concerned, even though 
it's already $8.55. You say, well, that's a cheap stock. Well, really, it's not that cheap. It's got a market cap of $7 billion. Another one that um, people seem to love that I'm not very enamored with is Palantir. And the reason why is because, again, they don't make any money and they've got a massive market cap of $23 billion. They're even at $11.39 a share. This is a very expensive stock. And let me show you why. So their market cap is $23 billion. The market cap of SoFi is $7 billion. The market cap of Macy's is $6.91 billion. Let's see, the market cap of, say, Foot Locker, which we've all heard of, is $3 billion. Now, remember, Mark, Foot Locker is $3 billion. SoFi is $7 billion. Palantir is $23 billion. The market cap of, say, uh, Sam Adams is, let's see what that one is. The market cap of Sam Adams is $4.25 billion. Again, it's, you know, SoFi is not two Sam Adams and, and Palantir is definitely not five Sam Adams or six Sam Adams, but according to this, it is. And, and Sam Adams actually makes money. It's got a, it's forward P is nice, but it's, uh, it's, it's trailing 12 months doesn't seem to be so uh, solid. But anyway, those are reasons why I'm not crazy about those, those popular retail stocks right now is because they don't make any money and their market caps are really large. And especially in the case of SoFi, they're soon going to be compared to a bank. So I don't know where the bottom is for that thing. So let's go ahead and take a look. Um, like I said, I've been making money this year or this, this month here. Uh, it started on uh, the 28th of February through the 11th of March, and I've made $588. It's not a ton of money. It's 11 days. By the end of the month, it'll probably be like maybe $1,100. Unless I, unless I hit it big on, on one of my bets here. But um, what I'm doing essentially is through uh, selling covered calls and cash secured puts is, and I don't mean to be cruel, but what I'm doing is I move money from other people's portfolio into mine. And the way that I do that is that with every, um, with every, uh, I sell covered calls. And so with every person, everybody, I'm selling so out there, there's a buyer. So somebody's buying this and then in the end, they give me $54 in this case. Not all, not all uh, are winners. We can see right here, I lost $87. I lost on that exchange. I lost $188 on this exchange. Um, mostly they're all winners. Let's see, I lost on that one. And I lost on DocuSign. The DocuSign one, this is very interesting. Let me show you, uh, let me show you before I go into the details of how to do these um, covered calls and sold puts, let me show you something that's very interesting about the way that big money controls the stock market. Now this happened and I knew it would happen. First of all, I only stood to win um, $205. So what I said was I would sell the right. I would, if DocuSign were to drop below $75 by the 11th of March, I would buy 100 shares of DocuSign. I got $205 in premium. And I ended up losing $10, so I had to buy it back for $215. The reason why I'm not losing very much money when I lose is because this is not very much money to win. The more you stand to win, the more you stand to lose. And I tend to make small bets. I also tend to take profits very quickly, and I'll show you that in just a bit here. Um, but something that happens with DocuSign, and I'm going to show you that this is the way that these big hedge funds control this market. And so, like I said, if I was to, I selling, I sold a put on DocuSign, which makes me have to buy DocuSign 100 shares if it finishes below $75. So do you think it was a popular bet for big money? It finished at $75 and one cent yesterday. And let's say it got as low as $71. And then right here is, is close to like at 3.50 PM. This is Eastern Standard Time, it was 74.15. And only right at 3.55, it was 74.10. And bam, right at four o'clock, it finished at 75 bucks. What does that mean? Well, somebody with a lot of money, some large market mover went ahead and moved this stock up so that they could keep premium and make other people buy the stock. So they were just trying to hang on to their premium. And so that's the way that this market gets manipulated. Big money can do this. Um, I got out, I wanna say right in this in this time frame, like the the, maybe about the three o'clock time frame, I finally said, yeah, you know what? I'm only gonna lose 10 bucks. Maybe it was about 
305, something like that. I'm going to lose 10 bucks, um, so who cares? But I suspect it will go up at the end of the day. I could kind of tell from having done this a lot before. I could tell it was probably going to do this at the end of the day. But, you know, I wasn't going to sit around for $10 and find out the hard way that it wasn't going to do that. So, yeah, so that's that's um, that's that's one way that the market actually manipulates stuff like DocuSign. So let me go into... Um, one of the trades here that I, one of my favorite stocks, and that's Lowe's. And um, Lowe's is a company, again, you want to buy a safe stock. You don't want something that's going to be um, too questionable. There's a lot of good stocks out there. There's Disney. Um, there's, um, Disney is actually not got a very good price earnings ratio, but I trust Disney. I could do this for Disney if you want a cheaper one. One other, uh, Toll Brothers, I like them a lot. They're like 50 something dollars. You could do it with, um, I don't know. There's a lot of good stocks. I'll actually uh, maybe make another video about how to screen for stocks and using Finviz. But in this case, I'm using Lowe's. And Lowe's is a company that we all know and like. We know that's got a good moat. We know it's either Lowe's or Home Depot. We know they're big in home building. We know they're not going to go out of business. We know they pay a dividend and they're a good solid stock. And should this stock go down, I don't panic too much. And if you owned it, you wouldn't panic either. So I bought this stock for $249.24, 99 shares on the 19th of November. And um, on the 18th of November, I bought one for $247. I'm just kind of keeping an eye on it. And then finally I just said, hey, you know what? I'll just buy it so I can start selling contracts. One downside of selling these contracts is they are expensive. This costs a lot of money just to do this much. Um, it did pay me a dividend that I had been, uh, reinvested. My cost basis on this is $249.23. Right now, Lowe's trades for $222. So you can clearly see that I'm down about 20, uh, what? $2,700 on lows right now, or am I? So let's go ahead and look and see what I've done. So if you include my options on lows, um, you can see that my cost basis on lows is not $249, but my cost basis is $243. And I'm able to bring my cost basis down through the sale of options. So even though I never once bought a single share for $243.84, that is my cost basis because of all of these um, all of these calls and puts that I've done. So here's here's a call here that I lost on. So I bought it for 140 or sold it for 149, bought it back for 305. So these are so you don't always win. Remember where there's a seller, there's a buyer. So you're essentially making a bet against somebody who thinks differently from you. You're not always going to win, but most of the time when I do win, and so. Because I because I try to make a little bit of money. See, here's here's so here's the reason why I would have lost this one. See, this was a lot of money, and so that was a bigger bet. But if you do little bets like this, I I sold it for sixty six, bought it for forty four, sold it for seventy four, bought it for sixty three, sold it for forty seven, bought it for thirty seven, and so on and so forth, until yesterday. So we'll just use yesterday as an example. Um, so on the eighth of March, I sold this uh, covered call, meaning that if if Lowe's finishes below $240 by the 18th of March, I would have to sell them 100 shares for $240. Now remember, my cost basis is $243. So really, I shouldn't be selling this because if it should sell, I lose three, uh, $384. So you got to be careful about that. You always want to keep it above your cost basis. But I sold it for $134.35. Well, actually $135, but it's $134.35 after, after Charles Schwab takes their bid. And I bought it back yesterday for $35.65. Now, why didn't I get the rest of this? Well, Lowe's will have a green day sometime next week. You want to sell covered calls when the market is going up. So right now, um, uh, Lowe's is sitting at $222 at some point this week. It'll probably go up here where it normally goes to about $229. When it gets up to $229, then I'll go ahead and I'll sell a covered call again on Lowe's uh, for say $244 and see if I can't make like, I don't know, 90 bucks or something like that and give it a, a, about a week out expiration. And I'll just keep nickel and diming this until finally I start bringing like if the stock price won't come up to me, I'll find my way down to the stock price. I'm also doing this over here with Microsoft. So if we look at Microsoft, um, I bought Microsoft 
for, let's see, your current year. I bought Microsoft for 317 on this date and 314. Well, I guess both of them on that date. 100 shares on that date for a total of $315.98 is, is my cost basis. The reason why it, that it's down uh, 315.98 is one I, have, I bought some less than others. And secondly, that paid me a dividend. The div dividend was reinvested into the shares back in, back into the into the company and when i bought this back i got it for 285 dollars so right here it says my cost basis is 315 dollars and 98 cents so that means that i shouldn't sell any covered calls on microsoft for below 315 dollars and 98 cents or is it less let's see so if we look at it plus my options my cost basis is not 315 my cost basis is actually 312 31281. So I've made about $300 on Microsoft um, options this year. And so in addition, so, so, so when I try to sell cover calls, again, I want to get above 31281. And that way, even if the I lose money on, if I have to sell my shares, I don't lose money. And so I'm just going to sell like little small victories and try and, and try and, uh, uh, Try and get my money back, or at least bring the cost basis down to Microsoft. Microsoft is down to 280 um, in the last five days. It's gotten up as high as about 288, 288. So when it gets up to 288 dollars next week, I have no reason to think it won't. On that day, I'll sell another covered call on Microsoft. Now, the other thing that I can do is I can um, sell cash secured puts, like we said. So what that means is that. Um, let me see here if I on cash secured puts. Uh, let me see if I got any here. Here's one on CrowdStrike. So CrowdStrike, I said if it uh, by the 11th of March, so by Friday, if it was below $135, I would buy 100 shares of CrowdStrike. And so I sold it for $159. I bought it back for $2. I made $157 because instead of going down on earnings, CrowdStrike went up on earnings. And so it's currently trading for $190, which is a lot more than the $135. So that would be one instance where they paid me out for that cash secured put. So that's how I'm doing it. It's, it's small gains. Um, what I try to do is I try and get, I try to get in and out of my trades pretty quickly. So I don't mind making $30, $40, $50. I don't sit around and wait for the other 30, 40, $50, because if just in waiting that extra week, like I got out of my trades last Friday, because you never know if you're going to have great news this weekend. I'm essentially making bets against other people. And so I'm moving money from their portfolio into mine, and occasionally I move some from mine into theirs. And but uh, but what you want to do is when you win, uh, just win more than you lose, and don't try, don't be too risky, don't be too greedy. Uh, the, the end of the day, the stock market's a game of uh, aggression and patience, which is what makes it really odd. You know, you got to have the aggression to go in there and get it. Uh, not be too greedy and the patience to wait out these market downturns. All right. So if you got anything out of this video, yeah, please like subscribe, hit that little notification bell until you then we'll see you next time. Have a good day. Bye.